Hello and welcome to Monday's episode of the Terrace Scottish Football Podcast. I am your host for this occasion, Craig Fowler, and I am joined by Tony Anderson. Hi, Craig. Hi, how's it going, Tony? Oh, I am well. I just got the fright of my life, though, because I put these headphones on, you know, and I put the headphones in my ear, and they are, without doubt, a fucking disgrace. I wouldn't show them to anyone. Uh, they are caked, caked in earwax. I think I've probably been using these headphones for around... Since maybe, maybe since I got home from travelling, and they are, they're a disgrace. I'm going to have to... I'm just going to have to switch it up now. Going to, have to, going to have to use some of the money from this to buy new headphones, possibly. And for those watching on YouTube, he's late joining the call, but he is here now, and that is Joel Sked. Hello, Joel. Hello. Um, I, I have uh, all my Terrace uh, chats on mute, so I didn't see the message. Usually I just get it sent to me, me personally, so ah, right, okay. um, that's, why, that's why I didn't see it. I'll remember that next time, that you, that you hate all of us. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people put in a lot of messages in each day and I don't want to read them. Yeah, um, there's, there's a few that I don't want to read every day. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's why that's why we're mute. Not just the Terrace, I've got other group chats that are on mute, but um, the Terrace is the main one that I've got. Someone's uh, fucking that's, popular, that's, eh? Fuck yeah. That's, um, that's, uh, that's mute. Um, too popular, Tony, yep. I've, I've, I've liked fewer friends. <laughs> Is, uh, I want something you uh, sometimes in need of happening when you're trying to do work and there's just like messages. Mm-hmm. I've I've had I've had WhatsApp notifications off for years because it was just like it was sort of was like first starting at the Scotsman, just like doing stuff and then like every minute just like something mm-hmm. happening and it'd be like just constantly getting distracted. It's like right, I have to stop this. I'm, I'm actually not doing any work now. I have to leave my phone in other rooms sometimes just so I can <laughs> yeah. do like when I have yeah. to when I probably have to sit and concentrate. That's what I have to do. I'm addicted. Just the way it oh, is. is is that you in moaning about another foul on a Rangers player? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it is. <laughs> he's still at it. He's still at it. Forty eight <laughs> hours later, he's still at it. And yeah, let's begin with that game. So we will start with looking at both of the old fun defeats at the weekend. It's not very often that both of the. Glasgow Giants are giving a beating in the same weekend and it happened this one. Rangers were beaten at home 2-1 by Motherwell, but Celtic could not follow up the next day with our three points that we'd take, would have taken them above Rangers in the league table. Instead, they are beaten by Hearts. So, the game at Ibrox. Motherwell 2-1 victors and Tony, this just continues. Theo Bear already, he's, he's got it wrapped up already, really. The, the Terrace Award for Most Improved Player this season the Scottish Premiership. He's got to be the most improved player in Scottish football this year, surely. He's got to be the most improved player in Scottish football history, <laughs> uh, Mr Fowler. <laughs> uh, the, the, the point that you're talking about that award, I don't think it's silly that the, the award's name should change to the Theo Bear Award. After, after Josh McGuinness. But yeah. yes, Josh McGuinness won it, like, Josh McGuinness was nominated twice and maybe even won it twice. So Theo <laughs> Bear's going to have to ascend to another level to do that. <laughs> there's there's a feel there's a there's a I don't know there's there's a mystique or a feeling around Josh McGinnis. I just think he suits he suits this. Hmm. Okay, he was a goalkeeper. What he was a goalkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> but with Theo Bear, it's like we're 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 not just having the the straight sort of the renaissance of from last season to this season. We're now doing it during a season because we had the period where he was sort of reinvented as a winger. And 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 we, we thought, all oh, right, is that all it's been? We're just playing him as a target man, and that was completely wrong and stupid. And we were doing that. Uh, St Johnston are just idiots again. Oh, but then since obviously because of loan deals finishing and Motherwell having t- uh, not having another striker, Bears been moved in, and the way he led the line there was was exceptional. He he, he drifted out wide, and the way that the, he's, Kettlewell seems to understand that. He's just not particularly good in the air, man. So you just don't launch balls. Even when you were doing long balls, it was going into his body or they were playing it into his feet or they were letting him drift wide. They were letting him put his body in between the ball. And it just seems like he's got a manager who actually understands who he is and doesn't just sort of look at him and go, oh, yeah, he'll be, this is the type of player he is. He's actually taking time to, to watch him and understand him. It's still a mute, Joe. He's bordering on. Sorry, I've got um, I've got I've, I've got a pesky um dog that's making uh, noise in the background, so I'm trying to mute myself every time I'm not speaking. But uh, he is he's turned into he's other than like you said in the air. He's 
just a perfect. I was going to say the all an all um, like the all round striker. I'm not going to. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to quite say that. But he is. He's turning into someone who you think. Yes, I would like him as a focal point to my attack. He can play in, in a two. He can play as a one, which it's, it's absolutely massive. And I mean, you look at his all round game, but his finish for the, the the goal is absolutely incredible because what there's three he has to do it really quickly. There's three Rangers players kind of converging on him. And he's up against Jack Butland, who has made a habit of stopping, like making being that goalkeeper who makes saves that you don't really expect him to make. There was one place that Phil Bear could really put that score, and he did it. He's just. So I was going to say that it, there could be a the Theo Bear will, will win our, our prestigious, obviously, that he really cares about this, our prestigious <laughs> most improved award this season. But there's a possibility that it could be a contender in future because there is still, you can even see from this game, there are still ways for him to improve. Like, I don't know whether he's going to get, ever be, if he's ever going to have like a touch good enough to play properly, he's back to old, don't know if he's going to get a lot better in the air so that he'll add more of those elements to his game, but he's still young. I wouldn't be entirely surprised if he gets better at both those things as time goes on. But you just saw in this game, like, he's decision-making because he's terrific for the goal, makes his mind up right away he's going to hit it. The Rangers player's conversion, keeps his cool, as Joel says, sticks in the corner. But then the moments in the second half, Twice he's going, mm. he, he, twice he does well himself to, to help start in. They wouldn't be in the position that they ended up being in if it wasn't for him. But both times he makes the wrong choice and he either passes the ball too late or he tries to shoot himself when there were options on to, to make the better pass. And decision making is certainly an aspect of his game that is still a bit poor at times, but it's been better as this season's gone on, as he's gotten more confidence. And as he plays more, it'll, it's something that should, in theory, keep getting better as well. Could he could he could he win both the Josh McGuinness and the MVP award? <laughs> <laughs> could he do the double, the unlikely double? Uh, Lauren Shankland might have that one wrapped up. But I know I know everyone likes to do the lols about certain players, Taverniers, your Goldson. There's guys like Connor Goldson. But Golden Goldson, let's be honest, has been pretty much imperious for about five years in Scottish football. Ah, you can pick out singular moments where he looks like he might look like a huddy or whatever, but he was given the absolute runaround for like over an hour by Theo Bear. And it not and it wasn't just moments, it was every single time the ball would hit, he looked like he was in sheer panic. And and, and that's I, I think you rarely see Goldson being put under that sort of strain for such a for a, for an entire game. Uh so I, I can't I can barely think of any other striker like apart from maybe Kyogo, but Kyogo does it in a different way. You know, Kyogo yeah. goes, goes away from you. It's not someone just going head to head with you and Goldson making look, and Goldson look like, like a huddy, basically. But it's, it's got to the point now where you're thinking, <laughs> you're like, let's not allow Motherwell just to play long balls to us because if you just hit it in his, in his vicinity, He's just that awkward, he's just awkward size, but technically quite good. He's just so uncomfortable to play against. They're just like, well, oh, that's, and there's a chaos factor element to it as well. So it's just so difficult to defend against. He was fucking hopeless at St. Johnston. <laughs> like, I mean, like when he came, he came on, like I, like I remember being in Perth watching last season and he came on and I was like, that's, that's nothing to worry about here. And he was a farce, he was a joke. He ball was just bouncing off his shins. He couldn't do anything. He couldn't turn with the ball, and now he's sort of battering the one of the best defenders in the Scottish top flight over the last sort of decade. I just want before we move on to Rangers, there's a, a couple of other Motherwell players I think deserve of some praise for this one. As good as Bear was, I think most Motherwell fans their, their star player of the game was Bevis Mugabe, because Rangers missed a lot of chances in this game, but they also had a number of opportunities that were blocked by a very Terrific job from Motherwell in, in terms of last-ditch defender and th players just throwing their bodies on the line. But Mugabe was at the centre of the, the back three and he's been in good form of late, as has now... This might be something that people will kind of react against, but as is Liam Kelly. Now, <laughs> Kelly's not had a good season overall and he did make the high-profile mistake in the Scottish Cup defeat to Morton. Now... Saying that's his only mistake of the last three, four months doesn't sound too great because it was a bad mistake. It highlights a lot of his glaring weaknesses, which is his kind of lack of size and lack of authority in the penalty area. But for somebody who was so bad, so bad earlier in the campaign, to now be putting together a bit of form and a bit of momentum and maybe bringing a bit of confidence back into his game, I hope he, I hope he still has a clanger in him between now and the end of the season so he doesn't get on the flight to Germany. 
But we all liked Liam Kelly as a goalkeeper in this league when he was at his best. Maybe he has hit rock bottom and this is him coming back now because he certainly had a good game at Ibrox. Yeah, I think he had, he, had, he had a good game. He didn't have a great game because I think it was Alistair Lamont, uh, Lamont on the BBC. He was like, I think he described uh, a save from Silva as absolutely terrific. And it was just hope. And this is something we'll come on to talk about Rangers. It was just hopeless finishing. And there was, again, it, there was no like tremendous saves. There were some really good, a couple of good, good saves, especially in the second half. There was a, a kind of double save. But I think Motherwell were... What was what was better than Motherwell's uh, than Liam Kelly was Motherwell's last ditch defender, like you said, some clearances off the line, and then he saw it with the he saw an issue with Kelly when they thought they conceded the goal, but it was offside. And he just uh, a, a a ball that was in the air in the six yard box, and he was just he's not got the presence to deal with it. Blair Spittle for Scotland. When are we when are we starting that? <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> get up, get up, I was play. talking. What's that? Top, top. Double figure goals, double figure assists um, for Motherwell this season. So that's like twenty I, goals. I, I don't think he's got there yet, but I think I think Graham was saying he'll get, he'll get there by the end of the campaign. Nah, that's good enough for me. He's, <laughs> he's, he's not, on the plane. He's, <laughs> by the way, he is not far away at all. He's on. He scored 11, 11 goals in the all competitions and nine nine assists. Oh yeah, so he's definitely going to get it. Well, you would think so. So he's got he's been involved in twenty goals. I mean, Shankland is an incredible season. What's he been involved in twenty nine goals or something? Because he only had a couple of assists. So he's not. Assists. Really, what was that? Sorry, four assists. Is it four? Well, sorry, I, I think so. I, just, I stick with something that I read about Shankland two months ago, and then that's my, <laughs> that's me. That's me. <laughs> that's me going forward till, till the end of the season. I'm still thinking Hearts are getting tons of penalties. You know that. <laughs> 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 well, he's just not taking them or scoring yeah, yeah. them, but he does. And I said, but just before we move on to Rangers, J- Jack Vale. Yeah, I was going to. I was just about to bring him up before we moved on. Like, not somebody I had high hopes for at all yeah. in January, but he just looks like a nuisance, really, at the top. Yeah, of like, useful. Yeah, yeah. He's he's the type of striker, he'd, and I think every team, uh, most teams in Scotland, uh, Premiership need him. Where he's yeah, a pest. He runs about, and I think he is. Uh, he's a good foil for 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 Theo Bear. But we were talking uh, just on spell. We we're talking about it yesterday after the Hearts game that uh, comparing him and Danda, and you're just thinking like Danda almost seems like more of a hip signing, and Spittle a Hearts signing. Just um, Spittle just seems a bit more hardworking. It's only a pre-contract, and if Richie Britton told us taught us nothing, it's that pre-contracts are not really worth the, the paper they're printed on. You can back out. I would like to see Hearts back out of the Danda deal. <laughs> And go and spell out a contract. Oh, so he's saying yes. for some minute, hasn't he? He's really uh, thinking. There, hmm, if I jump the gun, <laughs> <laughs> no, there's been ch- there's been chat. I think there's been chat of some minute, but I mean, he should be looking um, up the uh, further up the table. I or, mean, or, or means, further down the table, Aberdeen. Yeah, I was going to say <laughs> yeah. that, that only means hearts <laughs> or those firm. <laughs> right, Rangers. So <clears throat> obviously, Rangers will be buoyed by the fact that they lost the game at home. They've not really slipped up much at all under Clement. This was a bit of an aberration because they still had the chances to win the game and then should have done so. And then Celtic the next day going mess up any chance they've got of, of like taking advantage of that by, by losing the hearts. So they'll, there'll be some renewed confidence because of that. But there's a couple of things from this game which will be very troubling for Rangers. One, Joel's already touched on the lack of finishing. Silva is not, doesn't look like somebody who's going to be relied on to stick the ball in the back of the net when he has a chance. He, he can score. He, he scored a very nice finish against Hearts, but overall not been a great goal scorer in his career. Dessers probably going to get 20 goals this season, but the amount of chances that he missed shows he can't be relied on in games either. But I think the more pertinent one for this game was Ross McCausland going off because it was also revealed by Clement on Saturday that Oscar Cortez is needed surgery and they're in discussion with Lon as to whether he might have to actually return to France for that. So he might not be seen for a while, if at all, the rest of the season. They're already without Sima. Matondo's injured as well. They've got no wide players left apart from Scott Wright. Like, that's, that's got to be an issue. And Joe, like you say, like the, the, the chances that they missed in this one. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, Scott Wright, Scott Wright just seems to survive at Rangers. <laughs> you forget that he's there. And then he pops up and like, oh yeah, he's going to score the winner against Hearts in the Scottish Cup final. <laughs> Fine. Great. But no, Ray, that's, I mean, it's, it's an issue that's hampered Rangers for so long this season is their 
inability to finish chances, their decision making. Because it, it's not just, I don't think it's one thing. Decision making in front of goal, but also just really, really poor finishing. We've seen it with Dessers, we've seen it with, with, with Fabio, uh, Fabio Silva. And in those moments, especially Rangers and Celtic, you need guys who are clinical, kind of calm, composed, and just have that that sense where it drops to them and they've just got the they've got an awareness of where they are in the box and where everyone else is in the box because Raising Celtic are playing against defences where they've got six, seven, eight bod- bodies in the box. So there's very little space. They've uh, and it's not as, as if it's one on one with a goalkeeper all the time. So yeah, Rangers' biggest mistake in terms of this season, if they don't win the title, will be not signing, not signing Shankland. And something I'm very, very grateful for. Scott, Scott writes like a character in The Walking Dead in season nine. Just cannot, nothing <laughs> happened. Nothing, just keeps on chugging away. Andrew Lincoln. <laughs> but either this is, this could be a hot, the, the whole week could twist on Clement in a moment. You're talking about all these injuries piling up. Goes to Benfica on Thursday. Uh, where, where the Europa League, that's going to, I know they got beat 5-0 there by Poro, but it's going to be a tough game by definition. It's going to be a hard game away, especially when you're struggling for players and you're wondering, he's probably going to want to play Dijon Sterling in about three separate positions in, in this one game. And then he's going to, quote unquote, a resurgent Hibs, who it's <laughs> like for a lot of these lone players and guys that are coming, this is the game that they're going to be most interested in. Fans will be up for it. Nick Montgomery, it's a huge game for him. So it's, they're going to be asked questions in that game by by Hibs, so you know by the end of it, it could they could be out, they could be dumped to two competitions and finishing and then be second in the league. It's it is possible. Um, well, no, they can't be second in the league actually because Celtic got beat by Hearts, didn't they, Fowler? There's your link. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Tony. Yes, Hearts defeated Celtic two 0 on Sunday. And uh, yeah, a game that I I didn't see. I, I, I missed it because of um, this was my for listeners of the show will maybe know about Robert Borthwick's <laughs> error when he accidentally thought that a Scotland game against Israel, a very big game, was taking place at three o'clock on a Saturday. It was instead ticking off at the back of five. That was when Scott McTominay scored that late goal. A huge. Iconic, you know, defining match of the Steve Clark era in terms of Scotland and Rob missed it because he was watching James Bond. Well, I kind of not quite to the same degree because this wasn't such a kind of historic result, but Hearts beating Celtic doesn't happen very often. In fact, I worked out beforehand, I think I've missed now five, the last five times Hearts have beaten Celtic, I have not been there. And I missed this one because weeks ago I bought tickets to see. Uh, Billy Conley, Big Banana Feet, <laughs> restoration of, of the 1975 documentary at the GFT. So that's what was happening. That's what I was watching as I was checking my phone in the cinema and going like fist pumping, but also then dying a little inside with every decision and then go that, that went heart's way. But this one basically turned on 15 seconds early on in the match. Celtic get a penalty, a ridiculous decision, especially after VR has a look at it and says, oh, that's still a penalty. Like, just mad. Yang throws himself in front of Cochran and then goes to ground. And then they're still like, yeah, that's that's fine. And not even, not even throws himself in front of him, throws himself into Cochran and goes to ground. Mm. So I was about and, to say it's a bit different because the Olisania one, I believe, is a penalty. But yes. I don't believe that this one was a penalty and they've got subtle differences between them yes. that are important. And you're right. And Olisania gets himself in front of Devlin, whereas Yang doesn't do it with Cochran. He, he barges into him and, and goes down and it's it, it's... I can see why the referee gave it in the time, but for VAR not to tell him to Lucas is just a bit daft. But then Adam Eda steps up. He has a very poor penalty saved by Xander Clark. And then the ball doesn't even go out of play by the time it goes across to the other side of the park. Yang goes in with high feet on Alex Cochran and after a VAR review is then set off. Now, I think this one was... Well, I think it's the right decision as well. I hate these ones. These are, these are the type of decisions that don't really feel in the spirit of the game and are given getting given with far more frequency than they used to do because well, of they're, VR. They're decisions that have been created by VAR. They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're decisions that are created because you have the technology. They wouldn't have been. You would have. They would. There would be context given to them when this happened five years ago, and you would say, "Yeah, it's eye foot, but he's not. He's leaning back. He's coming out of it. He's trying to take a touch. He's not trying to harm the player. The player doesn't get harmed." But because you have the technology, you can go. Well, in theory, he is endangering an opponent. He's Foot's that high, he's standing up, 
by definition, he's endangering an opponent. So all context is removed and it's a red card. And the ref can't do anything about that. You can't blame the ref. That's that's the rules for that one. But this is what's happened with handballs and fouls like that, that they have been, they're new rules that have been almost created because we've got the technology. They're only there because we have VAR. So it's another of the long list of issues with VAR is, is that. So yeah, Halata sent off and Brady Rogers after the game saying like it's ridiculous that he sent off for that. Of course, forgetting that only 60 days ago, or well, 61 days I think now, that Celtic were playing St Mirren and Olesanya, to bring him up again, was set off by for doing exactly the same thing to Joe Hart and Brendan Rodgers. Funnily enough, didn't have a problem with that decision, said it was the right decision, regardless of intent. <laughs> so just typical managers, you know, being hypocrites, which is it's nothing new, to be fair. After that, Joel, I thought the most interesting aspect of the game from a tactical point of view was Hearts. It's something they started with, but then obviously it became, it remained a theme throughout the match when with Hearts eventually putting Celtic away, was Benny Beningame playing quite high up the park and basically doing a man-marking job on Awata. Yeah, that was something uh, James, um, my colleague, mentioned to me during the game early on. Just he was he, he was everywhere. Um, had a really good game because he was... <clears throat> he had, usually he's the kind of metronome in the midfield and he'd, he'd make the most out, like a lot of passes, uh, a lot of things would go for him. It's like fewer than his usual, uh, but I think he's someone that you need within there because he's good at winning the ball back. He's great at getting he's kind of his leg round players and, and stealing it. He's good at reading the game. But also, you know, from the flip side, when you get the ball, you need to keep it. He's really, really good at it. Yeah, he's not going to make some, he's not going to make sexy passes. He's, he's, he's going to make, um, he just, he's, he's going to make uh, just your bread and butter passes. Homely uh, passes. Sorry? Homely passes. Homely passes, yeah, yeah. He's, uh, there's no, um, there's no. I, I'm going to stop before I go to that. Really bad, uh, <laughs> there's quite a. Bad there's quite a. Get that, that. That's that's been something that that Hibbs done similarly on on Callum McGregor twice this season. You, but they done the reverse. That they, they used the striker dropping mm. in on him to do a man marking job in Vente, and obviously Hearts have sort of flipped that and made it the defensive midfielder goes into the attacking midfield to do the to do the same job. But it shows because I mean Hibbs in all three of the games that that's happened in. Uh, Celtic have only won one of those games, and I'm sure there's other one. They've only won one of them, and that was with a last minute penalty, Easter Road. So it seems like a, a blueprint for stopping Celtic is to sit on whoever plays at the base of that midfield. And it's easy, it's obviously a lot easier when it's a Wata and not McGregor, and also when the midfield is yes, a good player like um, obviously Matt O'Reilly is a brown player, but he's been off the ball slightly uh, recently, and then uh, Bernardo again, another good player, but it's not. The McGregor, Hatati, O'Reilly, mm. Mitchell three off the last couple of years, where any one of them can kind of control and dictate a dictate a match, and that's where when the the teams were announced, I was kind of going through it, thinking, you know what, it's not a Celtic team that's feared. Uh, Adam Ida up front, Yang. Then you've got the the midfield here for oh they could be bullied or certainly got out made for an uncomfortable afternoon at Tencastle and then again just like I just go back to it was, I know he's had a good season but Liam Scales he was mint at times it's like one of the worst individual performances I've ever seen last season at Hibs and that's where I was like if you can do all your kind of tactics why well, just I would be spelling out to the players if I was doing the team talks like this is a team that was there to get got at and even before the man advantage the heart started really well and. We're, we're really positive and very competitive. Let's talk about the loss of context. Penalties get being given then. <laughs> Fuck me. I hate these. And to be fair, Celtic have had these ones happen to them quite a few times. Mm. Um, the ones that... The, but it just got to the stage that if you're at the edge of the box 20 yards out, why would you bother trying to score? Just fucking try and head it on at the arm. It's a much more likely way of of gaining an advantage because if his arms like that then if his arms are wide nobody can see that not even on the audio the, the visuals can you see that <laughs> <laughs> but if you, if you, need, to go, you are, need to get up and go and stand at your door yeah. you do <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you need to so like if you have to hold your arm if your arms are out like that basically if the ball hits it from any angle it's it's a penalty even if the guy's right behind you it's just the biggest load of nonsense nobody's looking for it nobody wants it then you get a five minute wait and you know it's coming you know it's it's when you're sitting at home, I can ah oh, no, I can understand exactly what rule they're about to use now. It's been used a few times, but if you're in the stadium, you're like, 
What on God's green earth is going on? The all three, all three decisions. I thought you can just go right. You un, um, with context and uh, with hindsight, like I understand why they've been given. But if you're just being sensible, I would be. If all three were given against Hearts, I would be angry at all three being mm-hmm. given against Hearts. Because the handball rule was just it's just an absolute nonsense. Yeah, again, you can see endangering a player, but. I, he was just trying to win the ball. Def- Out of the three, the, the red card was the most. Like that By was the book. Uh, yeah, that that was yeah, that was mm. like right, okay, I can uh, I really accept that. But the, the two penalties were just just daft. Joe, was there anything else interesting for this game to touch on before we move on? It's, uh, and then, then be brief if you can, because we're up against it time wise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, mid is probably the hearts back three. The with with Frankie Ken and Craig Halkett missing. There was like kind of concerns about the someone taking that leadership role in the back three, but Sibbett came in for his only his third game this year, and Kai Rose, who probably had the best of the three because he got bullied by Cyril Dessers and got took the half time against Rangers, but he just played uh, Ida, um, he just played him really really tight. Anytime Ida got the ball, he was like basically smashing it at the back of him. He was engaging with him. He was really aggressive. He was getting his leg round and winning uh, the ball, winning tackles, winning interceptions. So the, the the back three kind of really stepped up, especially like, and Kingsley as well was playing with an injury for the vast majority of the game. So they they three were excellent, and Newhoff again was just was everywhere. He's like he's like Cammy Devlin, but better because I think he's better on the ball. <laughs> I thought we were getting a nice wee metaphor there, but nah, just it's like Cammy Devlin, just better. <laughs> <laughs> He's less of a shit though, so there is there's a, there's more of a yes. likability to, to Devlin, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. De- Devlin, Devlin has ha- definitely has his place, i.e. <laughs> um, noising up Alistair Johnston. Yeah, oh God, I... Or Alistair Johnston trying to choke slam children. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Your vibe, Mr. Johnson, you need to work on it. <laughs> right, we move on to our first of our features, and that is Say Something Nice, and this revolves around Hibernian's 2-0 victory over Ross County on Saturday and the person in particular we're going to focus on is Mr. Dylan Levitt. Score of the second goal, coming on at half-time for Hibs, and putting in one of his better performances of the season. But, in Tony, in fairness to him, Levitt has start to, started to look a little bit better in general recently, hasn't he? Yeah, I think that would be a fair assessment. And this game, this game's a big moment for him, and I would say for Nick Montgomery. I think it was a relatively brave move to bring Levitt on at half-time. Obviously, Myra Welsh has been really good for him since, since he signed. And although he wasn't having his best game, Myra Welsh, he was still he still wins the ball so often. He still intercepts so often that it allows you to take have complete control of a match. But Montgomery obviously noticed that we just weren't being incisive enough. And after I'm watching 45 minutes of Ross County, knowing there is absolutely zero ambition here for them to do anything. And it's me when you've taken Murray and Danda out of that team. There is, there's not, there's not an attribute for attacking. There is, there's just nothing. There's like, a, there's a Huddy up front who might score a header, and then, and then you've got Brophy who might shoot from far out. Like these are the two things that you, you've got. There is nothing else going on that team. Murray obviously causes havoc and is a nightmare to play against. And Danda obviously brings deliveries and and skill and, and maybe a long shot himself. So I think once it would been felt out, they're like, mm, we probably don't need a guy to go and win this ball back all the time. Once I, I, I try not, try not to be, I try not to be disrespectful here, but once I saw the Ross County team, my, my reaction was an audible, that is shit. <laughs> and it's, it's, is it a good job of not being disrespectful? <laughs> <laughs> so I try to be as, as respectful as possible because you just look at the Ross County side, and I know we'll come on to talk about heart. Uh, talk about him. We've got a couple of questions to ask you about that, but we're still not talking what? about Levitt. I don't get it. Yeah. The second this is done, I'll bring it Levitt round. I'll bring Levitt round. What? Like you look at what are Ross County? What are Ross? Like what are they? They're just they, they just don't have any sort of. Um, key comp- identity or key component well just- there's so many games this season and this is one of them where they set up to play so attritionally and, and trying to like shit fest their way to, to some points like one point or three points but the problem they've had all campaign and it's been like this for a couple of teams in the top flight Livingston are, are certainly one of them and we'll talk about them later on and they, they just give away so many easy goals like they, they make a, a defensive c- t- catastrophe just about every single game now in this one 
it wasn't so much the defence. I mean, they're not great for the, the second goal by any means, mm. but <laughs> by that point, they're already kind of a bit desperate and chasing the game. But the first one with Wickens, like it usually is a defence, it's not a goalie. But this for me, Joe, when we talked about Wickens on the goalkeeper's podcast, and again, I'll go back to it. I just don't. I just think it's a wrong decision by County to play him instead of Laidlaw. I think you can see from the clips so far of him that he's a more talented keeper. He's certainly got the potential to go on and have a better career. But Laidlaw, over the last couple of years, two, three years, has kind of stopped really making mistakes. And what County needs right now is somebody to not make mistakes. Is it's certainly as obvious as that one, which... If that doesn't happen, do County just manage to stay the course and, and see the game out? Quite possibly. But you do look around the Leicester team, like guys like in the middle of the park, like King, Sheaf, Kayla, Jenks. Are any of these guys up to standard? And then up front, without, like, as you said, without Dan does quote-unquote creativity, although I do think that's a bit overrated at times, mm-hmm. and Simon Murray's pace and energy, you've got Jordan White, who only does his win-headers. He's only scored four goals this season against top-flight opponents. All and, against Rangers. And Brophy, who's either... <laughs> Unfit because he's coming back from an injury, or he's injured, or he's shooting. <laughs> you, you do, you do, you have to wonder. You, you, the only thing I can think of is something's got to come out about Ross Laidlaw. Some something like something heinous <laughs> as as to why he's not as to why he's <laughs> the not most unlikely back. player to pick out that there would be <laughs> scandal. So it was a quiet one story. So it was a quiet one. I can't, I can't with that. <laughs> Ten years time, we'll be doing uh, we're doing a podcast on uh, and uh, Tony's reading out Ross Laidlaw's Wikipedia. <laughs> and it's, 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 <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's like oh, it's like only got scout skins now. And now we can... <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, to... Tony, talk to us about uh, talk to us about uh, Dylan Levitt. He, I take it, it was just a case that Hibs just needed, you know, stuff it. Just bring on someone who is going to be able to produce on the ball. You don't have to worry about the defensive side of things. Yeah, it was about, it was about playing forward and playing forward with a bit of quality because he, he finished the game. He still had a few very erratic moments in the, in his own third, which is naturally going to happen because of just who he is. But he, he still had 84 pass completion. He had three completed long balls, which I think all created got Lewis Miller or Martin Boyle into really good attacking areas for him to create really, really good chances. It's his pirouette that creates the goal uh, for a start. And, and it's like, so it's picking up the ball deep. And as I said, for Montgomery, it's big because he gets a lot of stick for his substitutions, quite rightly. A lot of them have really worked against them over the course. But this one was smart. It was quick, and he was bringing on a guy that isn't necessarily hugely popular with the with the fans, so there, there was a bit of bravery with that. And Levitt really went with it. And then he had a period in the game where Hibs have done this a few times. They bring Triantis on to play defensive midfield because they're trying to keep him away from his own goal now. Uh, they play him in, in defensive midfield, and then that actually means Levitt moves into the role that Marcondes is playing. And against Celtic, he played that role and he scored. And again, in this game, once he moved into that position, he scored. So Levitt actually played two roles and really changed the game for Hibs in both of them, uh, which which was uh, tremendous from him. And he was at the heart of us basically taking more risks, much more incision in our play. Uh, and, and Hibs went on to win probably mainly because, because of that sub. Right, let's move on to our next game where we will focus on St Mirren 2, Aberdeen 1. St Mirren were losing to a Conor Barron thunderstrike in the first minute until injury time where a penalty scored by Mark O'Hara brought them level and then with the very next attack when Aberdeen went forward with the ball, lost the ball, St Mirren went up the other end and made it 2-1 with... Incredible scenes, I think it has to say. It, it's, I, I absolutely love it when you get a crowd reacting so f- like furiously and, and, and like furiously in a positive way to a goal that the camera is just shaking. Like, <laughs> it, just, it just always looks so class on telly when that happens. And that was the case at St. Mirror at the weekend. Now, Tony, I'll start with yourself because there was something, because myself and Joel watched this game, although... There was, there was for, for myself, there was, there was issues with uh, the picture kept not working. So it, it wasn't something I looked too closely at, but I, I basically saw the majority of this match and saw how it was playing out. You brought something up earlier in the chat about Aberdeen's playing this one. So if you go first with that, and then we can maybe have a counterpoint to it once you've finished. Yeah, I looked. At, I, I, I was shocked when I saw after it that, uh, Aber- that St. Mirren had nearly 70% possession. Now, don't get me wrong. I know that, Teams, when they go up against St Mirren, probably think the best way to play against them is they maybe don't quite like having the ball. 
but there's a line to that. There's a level to that sort of of, of that tactic. And allowing a, a mid table Scottish Premiership team is Aberdeen seventy percent of the ball just because you've scored an absolute raker within a minute of the game is is it's embar- It's pretty desperate stuff. It shows a lack of imagination. It t- tells me that again, Warnock doesn't really know about any of these teams or players. Or <laughs> he just thought, right, goal. We're struggling for form. Let's sit in. Let's just keep that to the end. And yes, it nearly worked until, of course, it didn't. The um, just or just because you take can extrapolate on that they had they had forty eight accurate passes in the second half and just over the like over the last three games their accurate passes has been forty nine percent against Kelly sixty two percent against St Johnson forty nine percent against St Mirren for context Livingston's average pass success rate this season has been sixty two point five which is the lowest in the league and it's not as if they're playing loads of passes. 139 accurate passes against Kelly, 206 against St. Johnson, just 100 against St. Mirren. What are they, what are you, what are they doing? What are you doing? <laughs> it's, it's, it's feeble. Right, okay, so I do, so I'm going to play devil's advocate a wee bit here because, yeah, it certainly has a, a lack of belief, but then Aberdeen have been so poor of late and have been so poor for a lot of the season that there, there just can't be much belief in that squad in general, much confidence either uh, on an individual level or on a collective level. In this match, for the most part, they at least looked like a team that had a game plan and knew what it was doing. And St Mirren, so in the first half, I kind of thought, well, St Mirren should probably be into this, back into this by half time, even though Aberdeen were playing a bit better in the first half. Duke looked, first half only, really, but Duke looked a bit more dangerous. Junior Hoylet looked like he was capable of something, although they were a bit wasteful in the final third. Shinny was having a decent game. Conor Barron was having a good game. Their defence was was playing well. And what keep, uh, quite importantly wasn't getting turned. It was, was sitting a bit deeper, which I think helped the defence because A, like I mentioned, not getting turned, and B, it, it, didn't, it meant they didn't have as much space to defend because they've, you know, they've just had problems with defending in general recently. So the less room you give them to defend, the better they're maybe going to do it. And in the second half, Samirin, like, really ran out of ideas. Mm-hmm. Like, Robinson made changes, and with the exception of Olasanya, they never got any better at any point. They, they looked really poor, and I thought, for all intents and purposes, like, I thought this is, this is definitely heading for Aberdeen three points because it just didn't look like Samirin were going to do anything. And then a man who, when you look at the... When you, well, I'm talking about charge sheets again. When you draw up the charge sheet for Aberdeen this season... Nicky Devlin is low down the list, but in recent weeks, he has had some howling errors that have really cost his team. And this was another one because it's not just the clumsiness of going into the back of Osanya when Osanya just gets there in front of him. He is a bit unlucky, but he's not unlucky in the sense that he doesn't realise the immediate danger. If he, yeah. if he runs full pelt to begin with and launches a ball up the park, it's gone, it's away. He gets there before Osanya. He, he's too slow to realise that Osanya's coming, and that's the key. That means all the time he was able to get in front of him, and it's then, and, and at that point, Devlin then panics. He's like, "Oh shit, fuck! I need to get there." No, you don't. Now that all the is in front of you, you just let him have the ball. Yeah, he's force going after the wide. Yeah, force him, yeah, force him the, wide. Force yeah. him to then try and beat you and put a cross in. But instead, he panics too much, brings him down, and then after that, it was for the winner. It's Angus McDonald, as they mentioned on the sports scene. Just instead of staying with all the going to defend the the back post like it's a corner. <laughs> I don't know what I'll do. I'll, I'll stop the shot on the line. No, why don't you stop the shot from getting to the guy you're marking? That's what happens when you start panicking, though, when it gets yeah. sheer panic yeah. and, the, and the crowds change and you've just had these mortal moments happening against you. That uh, I'm, I'm not surprised that he behaved like that at all. They, they, I watched, rewatched the second half because I had similar buffering issues on Saturday. So I rewatched the second half just to see how if Aberdeen was as negative as... And, as as a thought, and if they were as poor as a thought, and like you feel, I thought it, it actually it actually worked until it didn't. Um, but they started really positively after the halftime whistle. Sorry, after the start of the second half, Junior Hoyle, it was really direct. They got the ball into good areas. Miofsky had a good uh, good chance at a header. Uh, there was another one where they had a uh, ball in, in the channel, uh, kind of over the top. Miofsky tried to get on his left rather than just shoot him his right, and he had a good uh, opportunity. But then they made a they made a double change and they went to a back, basically a back five with a five four one. McGrath was playing as a 
uh, right wing, but essentially is a, almost like a second uh, wing back. But they were so deep, and Kyan Phillips was almost like a supporting striker to Miofsky. And it was just like, yes, it's working. And like Fowler says, St. Mirren were struggling. And St. Mirren are a team that don't like chasing the game. I don't. It's not in their. It's not in their repertoire. It's not. It's, it's not a great skill of theirs. And just think, right, okay, it's it's working, but you're kind of just asking for trouble when you're so negative, when you're so so uh, so so deep. If you've created that, if you've created a second, a new position, which is the double foot wing back, then I think you really <laughs> yeah, are yeah. asking for a lot. <laughs> it was so 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 <laughs> deep, and you're just uh, you're just thinking it's only um, it's I don't know if it just again they should have sought out and the. They were doing a good job. There was no shots between the 70th minute and the 96th minute. There was, like, no team had a shot uh, until, um, the, obviously, and then the, the penalty. Yeah, and then, and then, then two, two key shots in the last uh, the last few seconds. So, I, I um, yeah, they, it, it almost worked. But, man, it's desperate stuff when you're having <laughs> to drop to a 5-4-1, play really deep. I and I. I <laughs> yeah, Jesus. when you're one nil up, and then uh, yeah, you've and, got, and, you got, you got a five million pound plus striker up, to, up, up top, <laughs> and then uh, you've got um, all a big. What a week for Olasanya wins them, mm. f- single handedly because he wins the penalty as well. And we and we were t- we were laughing next week because I claimed Mark Ondes won the penalty against D- Dundee. Not true. This was winning a penalty though. This was yes. through sheer force of will. He went and won that penalty, and he scored the equaliser when he came on against Ross County during the week. So he single-handedly popped four points up there for St. Mirren, and he's another one that will be swaggering around the, the terrace. Uh, most improved Josh McGuinness award, I think, yes, or super be. sub. Yeah. He could win the... He's not going to win that, so you might have to settle for the super sub now that they got rid of Grieve, who might have been the super sub. Um, they're all the same teams, these players. <laughs> Right, let's finish off this podcast with a double helping of Phil in the blanks. And we shall begin with the four... I was going to say four-all draw, that's not what it was. It was a four-goal thriller at Dundee. Another two-all draw between these sides. And the question is this, guys. Dundee throwing away 19 points from winning positions this season is blank. Tony? The way it should be. (laughs) A good laugh. Yeah, it's liquid Dundee and... And 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 I'm all for it. I've I've, I've said here before loads of times. Uh, I, I've loved Dundee games. I think Dundee are the best team to watch. And while that'll be really disappointing, and they'll be frustrated with it in terms of something to build on for next season, because they still have a good core of the squad going next season. That's easy to fix. Well, it's not easy to fix, but you know what I mean. They've got something to build on there. And on your first, your first season back in the top flight, for you to be ahead so often, for you to be competitive, for you to dominate quite so many games. I wouldn't get myself too worked up about that, although very easy for me to say when I'm not standing in the stands watching us lose again or draw again when we when we went ahead. Joel, what was your answer to this one? Yeah, very similar as uh, as the Dundee I know and love. <laughs> <laughs> I was just I was kind of blo- I was blown away earlier in the uh, the, the week. Well, blown away. Calm yourself. Um, I was... <laughs> Slightly surprised. <laughs> Slightly surprised when I looked at the league table and saw that Dundee had uh, conceded the most goals in the league. It was because I was just thinking they've um, they've made some key defensive signings like Carson uh, Portales had always been injured, and obviously Joe, Joe Shaughnessy like that's solid. They look a more a more solid outfit, and then bang, conceded the most goals in the league. It's like why can't you do? Why can't you get the defense right? Ever a, a big part of that, to be fair, is it's bad. It's obviously bad. Like regardless of context, if you conceded more goals this campaign than Livingston and Ross County, then that is bad, and you should hang your head in shame. Part of it is down to the fact that they've just been absolutely feeble against the old firm and have conceded twenty-one goals in five <laughs> games. <laughs> the the um, in terms of the losing the points, I remember being at Dave, so was Dave, when was at Dane's Park the last time for the Hearts game. There was uh, there was there was there was talk and just listen to uh, speaking to or listening to Dundee fans that they're really happy how Doherty sets up a team, but his in-game management is lacking. There was a guy honestly was he was about to um, I felt like he was about to uh, run down the stairs and chuck his hat at um, Tony Dock. Uh, he was sat just in front of the press box when Hart scored the third goal in the three um, 
uh, to, to, to come from behind uh, when and he was going absolutely tonto and uh, Tony Dock. Well, that, that, that sort of feeds into the idea that he's he's obviously very good on the training ground. He's very good at coaching, but that, not a hugely experienced manager about yeah. making those decisions during a game. I know that's quite an easy comparison to make with his background, but that's that's sort of what it would lend itself to. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing I call complaint for fans is that in matches when they're... Matches like this one, so they're playing against 10 men and... They just get like fans got frustrated. I think it's a natural tendency for teams to just do this anyway, and fans don't often understand that. It's not like football manager; you can't just do a slider that says like keep playing attacking when you're <laughs> when you're goal up against ten men at home. Like players are just going to naturally try to protect what they've got. But still, I think it's been a common theme this season that they've they've, they've sat back a bit more. And the problem with them Dundee try to sit back and defend these late leads is that they can't defend cross balls. It seems like, and they're not helped by. Joe Shaughnessy being in really poor form of late. Mm-hmm. So he's had a good season overall. He's been a good signing for Dundee. But over the last month or so, he's like he was bad against Hibs last week and he, he was poor for this one as well. And I don't know whether it's... Gary was suggesting it's maybe a lack of confidence. I was trying to think why that would, that would, why the, why that would be other than them conceding so many goals. And I wonder whether it's just the... He struggled a bit with hold, trying to hold the defence together at the beginning of this year when Portales went out for a while and then Lamy went out and you had like like Lee Ashcroft was coming back into the team when it was clear that he didn't have enough left at the top flight level and then they're bringing in Owen Dodgson from Burnley who no. doesn't have at any level and I wonder as, as, Joel, whether- as Joel would say pfft <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder whether just like try to hide it all together as maybe like knocked his confidence because too much the, responsibility. Yeah, and also as well, I wonder, like, I don't know, have they... I, I didn't see the, the team for the Celtic game, and so, but I don't know whether they've... So at the start of the season, it was Shaughnessy, Portales, and Lamy, and they looked good, the three of them together. Maybe it's time to bring them all, because they're all fit now again. Lamy was on the bench for this one. Maybe it's time to put them all together and then just ride through any kind of teething problems as they're kind of getting back up to... To speed just so you get that understanding and yeah, it can't be can't be worse than yeah, exactly, all the yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> and but the, the the thing that would disappoint me a lot as a Dundee fan is their possession based football is really, really good. They yeah. keep the ball really, really well and they do it in nice triangles. And would they be able to do that more in late later on in games, be brave on the ball like they are earlier in games to like try and see games out so there's less pressure. Put on the defense, again, very easy to say. <laughs> from me sitting in my bedroom than if you are actually on the pitch on a Saturday and teams are ferociously trying to get points at you when you're one nil up. Just quickly to finish on this game, from a Kelly perspective, I mean, great to get a point for the position they were in. Robbie D scoring the equaliser, but having a, a very good game on his return as well, having, having been out for a kind of extended period. It's, I guess the frustrating thing for Kelly's point of view was that they started off slowly but then after 20 minutes, really grew into the game. And until the red card could probably say to themselves, we were the team most likely to win that one. Lewis Mayo, who has had, I mean, he's been brilliant ever since he's been at Kelly, but he's had certainly a crack in 2013, 2013? 2023-24 campaign. <laughs> <laughs> he, has a, he has a shocker for that, for that red card, but he just, I think he just loses flight of the ball. And then there's a kind of discussion between him and Dennis. I was trying to think out whose fault it is more. I think it's definitely Mayo's fault. Yes. If, if, if Dennis knows that Mayo's leaving that, then yeah, he could come out. But I think he just expects his centre half to deal with it. And when he doesn't, it, it's too late for him to, to spring from his line and then collect. And it's definitely a red card. I don't know what McInnes is on about. It's definitely a foul. Definitely a red card. And yeah, it'd just be frustrating because there was a big chunk of this game where they looked very impressive. Danny Armstrong had a good game. Marley Watkins going again and then there was another moment where he went through and had the chance done very well himself to create the opportunity I think Matty Kennedy over on the far side was offside and that's why he didn't pass it but it's still in that situation where you're three on two and Watkins is still going through by himself on the goalkeeper you're expecting a goal for that situation so a few frustrations but considering there were 2-1 down away from home 10 men to get a point out of it it's fine stop putting the tip in and go full Van Veen Stop teasing us and get him on the pitch. <laughs> even though, like, well, even though um, Marley Watkins has been ridiculously good, ridiculously good this season. Uh, just, I know we uh, we've got one game to do, but we've basically only need ninety seconds for that. Uh, 
Can I just read you something? Whisper it, but I'm almost certain Dundee are finishing in the top half. I'm fully aware that the following sentence will curse Dundee, and for that, I'm really sorry. We are finishing top six. For a club that... For a club with what we will euphemistic, euphemistically describe as an interesting history in the top tier and a side fle- freshly put together this summer following promotion, this might seem a bold claim to make. However, that is all the evidence that could be put forward by the sceptics. By any other metric, everything points to successful conclusion to Dundee season that might even involve European qualification. That was Gary Cocker yeah, a couple yeah, of weeks that... ago and, uh, and his, his Dundee newsletter on the Herald. I was like, oh, I'm, screen- I'm screenshotting that. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Whisper it. <laughs> You're talking shite. <laughs> You've not beaten Hibs once this season. <laughs> Nick <laughs> Montgomery's Hibs. <laughs> You've twice been two goals up on Hearts and not taken anything from the game. <laughs> yeah, there's... You've considered the most goals, Gary, for crying out loud. <laughs> right, let's get to our final game. So this one, again, we're sticking with fill in the blanks. Having over 10 minutes of stoppage time in each half of St. Johnson 1, Livingston 1 was blank. Tony? A form of torture. <laughs> Joel? It was like having back-to-back lectures with someone who just asks questions at the end and prolongs your agony for longer and longer and longer. My God. Did you see the, the stat that the ball was dead? The ball in play. Uh, oh. The ball in play. So the ball was dead in this match for almost 70 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so the stoppage time that was like 40 minutes when the ball was in play and it was 70 minutes when it wasn't that's, that's, that's incredible I don't think I've ever seen a game like that the power I want Aberdeen to go down because that's what I'd prefer to happen but the league deserves Livingston and St Johnston to go away <laughs> <laughs> there was constant whistles from the referee there was the teams barely able to keep the ball inside the park there was Livy doing a lot of time wasting to, to try and get something out of this game and it's another example like yeah okay this levy team is not good at all obviously the bottom of the table you just have to look at the the lineup they put in most weeks there's not a lot of good players there michael nottingham's playing most weeks and their injury sorry in their situation they're hanging their hat on him like putting in the performance he he did against st mirren every week for them to stay up and that's not going to happen up front joe newbley has gone to bits teddy yenge is awkward and that's about it but they don't trust Bruce Anderson they've got little else their midfield is really aging they are a bad bad team however St Johnson are shit as well oh, yeah. and Levy for so many times this season went there with no belief at all in themselves to go and win the game they played the entire game like they were happy with a point then they get themselves ahead and it's like right St Johnson yeah they beat Aberdeen midweek but they were on a dreadful run before that with fans starting to turn on Levine and this is them back at home where they've been shit at McDermott Park for like well ever since Calum Davidson took charge for about three or four seasons now and it's ready for the fans to turn on that team try and do something do anything to to get themselves back in the game and yeah I know to frustrate the opposition is maybe the best way to keep the fans turning against them but also it's just St Johnson just stayed patient just knew eventually they would get a chance because the Livingston defence isn't good enough to not present them with a great chance and Sean Kelly completely went to sleep and Nicky Clark scored and it's just another example of, of Martindale just having absolutely no faith whatsoever in his players this season. I mean, if, if that game was in my back garden, I would have shut the blinds <laughs> and then set for fire at the house with me, in, <laughs> with me inside, just to be sure. But yeah, poured petrol on the grass. <laughs> so, so it goes right from the house. Are right? you fucking better than the big demo pitch? <laughs> there was also a very weird, very weird use of subs. So what, one, Bruce Anderson getting zero minutes. Curtis Goffrey. I know. Curtis Goffrey. Jesus Christ. And he also, not long before the goal. Super League with you, sir. (laughs) (laughs) Not long before the goal. I don't think it really had much to do with the goal, but it was just a weird sub. He brings on Jamie Brandon and Mo Sangari because he's needing a new midfielder and a new left back. And then he plays Sangari at left back and Jamie Brandon at attacking midfield. (laughs) Sir, what are you doing? I'm sorry. Jamie Brandon, but by the way, is not a number 10. <laughs> <laughs> Just for clarification. And, yeah, so I think that's all really to say about Livingston. They, it's just... I mean, they keep, getting a, they keep doing enough 
where it's like, oh, can we fully write them off yet? They are Livingston. They could really somehow do it, but I mean, Jesus. They've won one like, game in 22 matches. Uh, Let's sure, go, sure. Fowler. Can, we hope, <laughs> can Ross County just win one game so we can just stop asking the question if Olympia are relegated or not? But to go to St. Johnson, I think, I think it was a bit of a strange game for Levine as well, this one, because, I mean, fair enough, yeah, go with the pairing that worked against Aberdeen in midweek. It didn't work in this one, mainly because I don't think Aberdeen were ready for the pace of Kip Kweka and for St. Johnson just to basically kind of have a go at them with, with a front two. Levy were more ready for that, as you, you they would be. Like they sat with a low block, so it meant that there was no pace, like no space to exploit him behind. And obviously Levy were going to do that because they played a back four full of centre-halves. It must, like, if you're ever going to see a slower back four in your life than Nottingham, Obelai, Devlin, and <laughs> and Sean Kelly, then you'd be, you'd be lucky to see it. But he also had some, Levine had some strange subs himself. So Yaisime got injured just before half time and he brought, he brought on Graham Carey. But for large spells of Carey's time on the pitch, he played at right wing and Matt Smith was moved over to left wing. I could kind of see it with Carey. Like you get him to cut inside, or you maybe get them to play narrower, so you can kind of keep the formation you're playing with the two forwards, but also have Carey in a kind of advanced midfield position, and also as well, he can cut on his left and whip crosses towards the back post, and swinging crosses. But Matt Smith was just dreadful on the left side, and it took Levine uh, uh, quite a long time to realise that. So, St. Johnson, get the late point, but, and a lot, to be fair, most of what St. Johnson fans were complaining about was just how negative Livingston were. But it's not some uh, fucking cheek. <laughs> after hi, after after a great result in midweek, it, it's again not until not like the type of performance it's going to have Levine endearing himself to the St. Johnson faithful because regardless of the position you're in yourself, you should still be winning at home against Livingston and not require a, a late equaliser. Cool. Right, will that do us, guys? Yes, please. Put me yes. in the misery of St. John's and Livingston, I think. <laughs> Before I set fire, that was... <laughs> <laughs> I need to go set fire, my house. <laughs> right, thank you very much for listening, and thank you for... I, I, I don't know. I, I, I thought it was a Patreon episode there. I was going to say thank you very much for your support. Well, for those who do support, thank you very much. For those who don't, the opportunity is still there. Patreon.com forward slash Terrace Podcast. That is the best way to support this podcast and keep it going from strength to strength going forward. And for content, there is... Tomorrow, I'm unless there's some late call-offs, I'll be recording a couple of podcasts. One with an Aberdeen supporter to look at their current situation. So a whole lot of asking what you think about Neil Warnock. So that should be quite box office. And I'm also going to be talking to a Queen of the South fan to wonder, how is Mar- Marvin Bartley still on a job? Because <laughs> in an age where managers get sacked very, very quickly, he's been given nine lives by the Palmerston Park Club. But I want to find out what exactly the situation is there and whether there is hope that he will turn things around in the future. So if that sounds interesting at all, patreon.com forward slash Terrace Podcast. That'll do us. Joel, say goodbye. Goodbye. Tony, say goodbye. Goodbye. And I'm Craig Feller saying goodbye.